North Carolina in the Raleigh area and um, spent the first 18 years of my life down there. The first music that I really fell in love with growing up was, um, you know, actually originated in our home. It was uh, the way that my grandfather used to sing these uh, Muslim spirituals to himself in Gujarati. Um, and uh, it had this really reedy kind of like almost nasal tone to it. And he would uh, sort of imply where the pulse was with this like very slow, steady, um, pulsating tremolo kind of thing in the the voice is really distinctive. And the further that I go and sound, the more I realize just how particular of a sound it was. Um, but I, you know, I used to love that. And I would ask him to um, sing for me and I, I couldn't go to sleep um, if he wasn't there and singing it for me. And um, in fact, he was like hospitalized at one point when I was young and I had to call him at the hospital and say, you know, Bapaji, can you please like sing the Ginans? Because otherwise I, I won't be able to go to sleep. As I grew up at home, I sort of got interested in all different kinds of music because my mother's side of the family um, was actually pretty musically inclined. And in fact, her father was a violinist. Um, he passed away before I, ever, I was born, so I never got to meet him. But um, playing the violin was never like a, a viable option for him um, in terms of a career path or anything like that. But growing up, when my mom was growing up in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, um, he had a cafe and he would perform at night for the patrons, um, you know, at the at the bar. And that was kind of his way of like um, keeping up with his practice. And um, her sisters all there, there are five of them, and they all were singers. And um, so I kind of grew up with uh, the music that my mom liked, which was like a lot of Bollywood soundtracks and, and things like that. Um, and I got interested in hip hop because that was what a lot of my friends were listening to, and especially like older friends and family friends and stuff like that. And we would you know, go into somebody's car while all the parents were hanging out and turn the sound system up as high as it would go and, you know, just listen to, like, basically 90s gangster rap. Um, you know, so I, I kind of had these divergent um, influences, but also, like, strangely, there were so many similarities in all of it. I actually found myself not really um, developing too much of a connection to pop music. I mean, I think I was listening to a lot of the same stuff that, like, you know, kids my age were were hearing, but it was always just something that I, I feel like my primary attachment to it was social, you know? Um, but at a certain point around the eighth grade, I started you know, noticing that a lot of my friends were picking up guitar and bass and drums and, and stuff like this. And they were listening to all of this, you know, pretty um, incredible psychedelic music from the 60s and 70s. And I wasn't familiar with any of that because my parents didn't really grow up with it. And I, it wasn't something that we heard around the house. And I still remember when I first heard a recording of Jimi Hendrix, and that was like, I mean, as so many people who play the guitar will tell you, that really um, completely changed my life. And I just couldn't believe that somebody could express something that felt that human, like, through the sort of physical interface of an instrument, you know? Um, it really just felt so vocal and... Um, and there was something about the struggle in it on so many different levels, like the struggle for expression, for connection, the way that the, you know, the physicality of actually like coaxing those kinds of um, unbelievable, unreal sounds out of the instrument and also the use of technology and pushing 
sound into all of these sort of uncharted territories in order to arrive at this sort of human connection or expression like you could hear the the struggle for that um in everything that he was doing and it it just resonated with me in a really deep way and i think that that's what catalyzed um you know a, a growing level of seriousness about music and in particular i i went and got a guitar and started um started what has turned into a lifelong obsession when i was in i want to say it was first grade or something my parents uh took a trip with my dad's parents to india to go see where my family originally was from in gujarat it was the first time they were leaving us all here um and they asked me if they'd like anything brought back you know if I, i would like to have anything brought back i think they were trying to appease me because i was a young kid and didn't want them to leave so um i had been really obsessed with uh these zoo books which are like these little magazines that they used to have for kids and there was one about snakes so i was like really into snakes at the time as one is and i asked if uh they might be able to bring me back a snake charmer's flute and so they brought me back a ink charmer's flute which was very difficult to play because it didn't have you know like there were no fingerings or anything it was like all breath control um which obviously i did not <laughs> possess um but they also brought me back a wooden flute that did have um you know like i could use my fingers and um we were i i decided i would bring it to school the next day for show and tell and we were in the car my mom was driving me and i was in the back seat and she was listening to some it was the soundtrack to hum up ke hai kon i think and there was a song on there and it was on and all of a sudden she heard flute coming from the back seat and it was like actually kind of correct you know <laughs> and she turned around and saw that i had figured out how to play along with the song and she stopped the car and was like Okay, we got to get you music lessons. You know, I I don't know that anyone told me what improvising was or anything of that nature, but I would always just pick up the violin when I was you know, studying the violin and I would um just play it, you know, and and not necessarily always be playing something that was uh written down um you know and and especially given the fact that the Suzuki method was um so focused on ear training i think i was always kind of accustomed to well if i can learn classical music by ear why don't i maybe i'll learn fragments of other music that i like or maybe i'll you know try to take down this melody or maybe i'll start playing this melody but then what if i'm hearing something else so this concept of like what you're hearing and what you're playing being intrinsically connected was something that i think came really early on and very subconsciously and i don't know that i would have told you that i was composing but that's in retrospect absolutely what that was like the earliest um sort of impulse for but i think you know i really started writing more things in this kind of um this setting when i was in high school and everybody started playing instruments it it gave me this forum to kind of be like oh okay well what would happen if you did this and i did that and we together made this other thing <laughs> you know i've come to realize in recent years that my engagement with music really stretching back to the very beginning was always therapeutic you know and it was always a way of making sense of you know or trying to actively define or create um a sense of who i am in relationship to everything else and um how i'm connected with others but also how i can uh appreciate and uh express my own uh individuality and my own uh experience and 
you know, I as a kid, like, I didn't feel like I, I really ever quite fit in with anybody or, you know, I, I couldn't, couldn't ever make sense of um, some of those things in a, a more straightforward way, you know, and it wasn't that I didn't feel like I was like socially adjusted or anything like that, but just that there was always something that felt like it was a little different, you know? Um, and I think that, um, music from the very beginning was a way of, uh, coping with, of processing and celebrating that difference, um, and, and, uh, taking ownership over that and, um, making it into something that, um, was actualizing. When it comes to performing the music, um, I've been working really closely with uh, a trio with um, the electronic and acoustic percussionist Ian Chang and the bassist and multi-instrumentalist Jackson Hill. That is an example of such a relationship where um, I feel like there is a, uh, a home for my music as it develops, you know, and, and I tend to approach things a little bit differently than the conventional, um, you know, composition pedigree where you sort of, again, it's like this top down thing where the music is, um, documented in a recording as a sort of final, um, you know, or a more final evolution of the process. But for me, the process of creating a recording is actually, it's not a documentation. It's a, a sort of like the birth of the piece of music. Um, and then that continues to grow and develop through live performance um, and through collaboration. And, um, and so that uh, has been the case with these musicians and they both um, are astounding, um, com you know, composerly minds uh, as well. And um, so the way that we're able to, to sort of reconfigure and take apart and dismantle and reassemble the music um, in different ways every night that we play together is, um, you know, a big part of what the music uh, becomes over time. Um, and a lot of what we're doing together um, is very uh, much looking at sound from the perspective of its associations with memory um, and with, uh, physical, um, sort of connection and presence and also, um, you know, looking at sound from the vantage point of perception and its, uh, capability to, um, actually be a, a sort of, uh, confrontational force. Um, and so you know, I, I think that's really kind of the crux of what a lot of my own work has been about over the past few years. My most prominent um, and deepest association for the past several years outside of my own music has been um, as a collaborator in the band Sun Lux, um, which also features Ian Chang and um, Ryan Lott, who founded the project. He's a, they're both composers, um, and Ryan uh, started Sunlux as a solo project in 2008, and it was that until Ian and I joined in 2014. Um, and that is another project in which the three of us are all very heavily enmeshed at this point, and we've made a lot of recordings together, and like my solo work, it's um, very much uh, focused on sound and the sort of ephemeral qualities of sound and the physical presence that is behind sounds that are made and amplifying that. Um, with regards to Sunlux, I think um, we have a, a sort of preoccupation with popular song forms and how we can sort of use that as a... Um, use that frame as something that we can push back against in various ways and, and kind of um, play with expectations and, and perceptions about how that um, works, you know, and um, 
Ian and I have both learned a lot from Ryan, who's a, a great sound designer and a very forward-looking um, composer, um, but also, you know, sculptor of sound and um, somebody who uh, is able to kind of peel away the layers of what a sound appears to be in order to find um, other possibilities of what it might suggest or might be able to do. And um, so I, I've learned a lot from from being a part of that project. The first time I heard Kronos, I also don't know that I can tell you because I they're everywhere and I saw so many films that they performed on the soundtracks for and you know I mean I knew who they were um for a very long time but I think the first time that I really took note of Kronos and um it sort of hit me like you know where I really learned who Kronos Quartet were um was when I heard their recording of George Crumb's Black Angels um which I did not at the time know was sort of one of the inspirations for the inception of the group. Um, and when I met David for the first time, we had a long <laughs> chat about that. Um, but that's one of my favorite pieces for string quartet. And I know that that is also one of his. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that was really, uh, a revelation for me. And, um, there's just so much about the way that they have, approached music in that setting and also in other settings um, where um, some of these things that I'm talking about, about um, dealing closely with sound and texture, both on the instruments themselves and also um, in the way that they're, uh, you know, captured and recorded and translated in the mediums in which I first heard them, you know, all of which were recordings um, that always stuck out to me and, and kind of defined for me in a certain sense, like what the modern uh, sort of uh, standard could be. So this is actually my first piece for string quartet. Um, and having spent many years playing the violin and actually even a fleeting period playing the the double bass um i have a, a sort of interesting relationship to that family of instruments because on the one hand producing a sound on a bowed interface was how i first learned to to elicit you know sound that i liked <laughs> um and there's there's something um that feels very close to my own um my heart and also my way of expressing myself musically about that but at the same time it's been many years since i've played any of those instruments or you know really been um involved with them in that kind of capacity and my memory is not that good so um <laughs> there was this kind of uh, simultaneous deep familiarity and also complete, um, you know, uh, sort of wonder and awe at this new format. A lot of where I feel like my own personal growth has come from as a instrumentalist has been by like being faced with the task of saying, okay, I've got this guitar and I've got these electronics and how do I make this sound like a string quartet? Or how do I make this sound like, um, you know, fireworks? Or how do I make it sound like um, this, you know, uh, sputtering bit crush synthesizer that has dying batteries? You know, like, it's this kind of um, thing of imagining and then really rigorously applying your ear to develop a methodology or a technique to realize a sound that you want to be able to express, even if that's not a sound you've ever heard anyone else express before. Um, and so this piece was kind of 
written with my memory and my association with the string quartet, with all the things that I love about what it can do, but reflected um, through, you know, something like Mylar, which I represent in one of the titles of the music, which is this sort of reflective substance that when you look at your reflection or like look at anything reflected through it, it's just all sort of wavy and distorted and convoluted. And it's kind of like this uh, um, mutated version of whatever the thing is. And, um, you know, in the same way that uh, jazz guitar players emulated piano players who would slide into a note but those piano players were actually emulating blues guitar players who were bending the note and the pianists couldn't bend the strings, so they'd do the slide. You know, like, the same way this kind of Xeroxing um, or game of telephone musically ends up changing, you know, as things move from one interface to another, or like the way that hip-hop uh, producers tried to channel the energy of jazz drummers by kind of um, juxtaposing the feel of machines against a more human articulation. And then jazz drummers heard that and thought it was really cool and started emulating the way that the programming worked. Um, you know, I thought to myself, well, like, what would happen if I just used the guitar and I just used a lot of the mechanisms for sound production that I've developed over the years, many of which are subconsciously related to my early experience as a string player, what if I used that as the basis for developing a piece of music? And what if that then turned into something where the performers actually had to learn the music or transcribe the music based on recordings of me playing that stuff on the guitar? So while a transcription may exist um, that people can reference, the audio recordings will also be there as a guide for people to deal with rigorously and find ways to represent. And, you know, while what's on the page might be a suggestion for how to do things, it's not the end all. And the end all is actually the recording itself and the sound and finding your own relationship to that and figuring out what's important and meaningful about it to you as a group and finding ways to represent that on your instruments, even though it was generated on mine. I never know if anything will work, but I do know when there's something about a sound that draws me in, um, or something about an idea that draws me in, and usually it's that creative spark. Um, it's often some particular characteristic of a sound, or maybe even a recording of a sound, something about how um, you can hear the human being kind of moving or shuffling, or the fingers on the string, or, you know, just some ephemeral kind of quality about the sound itself or maybe it's about the the sort of um personality with which it's expressed uh rhythmically gesturally um but in the case of this music in particular i was really kind of thinking about um techniques that i feel like are indebted to the string quartet lexicon and that are channeling aspects of the string quartet lexicon and um you know but taking those things and sort of rendering through them through this otherworldly kind of um lens you know and by translating them from one instrumental context to another and doing so in a, a purposefully sort of um creative or proactive way, um, as opposed to the most literal translation I could find, um, hoping to inspire a result that would be like, sort of like a sonambulant or like phantasmagorical string quartet, something that feels like a, a, a different perspective on what the string quartet could be or do, um, and one that captures a lot of the nuances of what is interesting to me or um, that feels like I identify with in sound. Um, and so my hope is that as people engage with this music that they don't overlook 
those aspects that are like, oh, I'm listening to this part of the recording for my own transcription. I'm noticing that there's this part where the electronics he's using are glitching out and it's trying to track um, one pitch, but um, I'm hearing another one being reproduced. Maybe that's an error. I'll overlook that. You know, that stuff is all intentional and it's all meant to be something that you find a way to kind of... Um, see if you can recreate or um, embody using your own interface. And I can't wait to hear what that ends up sounding like. I hope musicians that are taking on this music also see it as um, an opportunity to expand uh, their thinking about how they might compose from the vantage point of communicating musical ideas to others and also uh, widen their purview with regards to who might be able to participate in their music um, and how. And I think one of the key lessons that I want to impart is that um, there's actually a lot of ways to deal with sound rigorously, and it's not just the ones that you're accustomed to learning about in school, and that some of the greatest rewards can come from um, engaging deeply with other perspectives on organizing sound. Um, and my hope is that that you know, as it has been a sort of pillar in the work of the Kronos Quartet will be something that this piece plays a part in um, enshrining as a, an ideal of the way that this kind of music works um, going forward. Well, the deeper I've gone in pursuit of my own musical ideas, um, and also the deeper that I've invested myself into collaborations that I've been a part of, the more I've realized um, how important it is for me to be at least conversant in, if not directly responsible for a lot of aspects of the music that are, you know, often thought of as technical work, um, or at least in the past used to be thought of as technical work, like engineering and mixing and um, sound design and programming and, and things like that. And I found that to really get the sounds that I'm interested in, that all of those aspects are actually, um, you know, that kind of technique is indistinguishable from instrumental technique or composerly technique. You know, it's all part of the same aim. And um, so I've been really invested in not only doing uh, that kind of thing with regards to my own music, but being involved in that practice um, in collaborations. So I've been producing records for people, I've been mixing people's records, I program and sound design. Um, and that is all teaching me so much that I'm just bringing back to my own practice um, as uh, you know, a composer or as a, a sort of like sculptor in sound. I mean, this sounds corny, but really just have fun and try to find yourself in the music. You know, this is, um, it's my piece, but it's also not about me. And I hope that it's an opportunity for you to find something um, that speaks to you and that feels personal to you and whether that ends up being in service of this piece or just something that you take with you into your future musical explorations, um, you know, I, I hope that this ends up being enabling for you. Mm -hmm.